Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. And today we're coming to you with a one hour tape delay because our webcast uh, or webinar provider had a system wide outage. So uh, thanks for being with us and we've got a great show for you. So let's get right into it. Looking at our agenda, we're gonna kick things off uh, talking about what's happening in Washington, DC. There's plenty going on. Then Lisa Simpson and I are gonna cover the latest and, and really the wind down of these business relief programs. And then I've got a great discussion. Uh, we're gonna have a great discussion with Ron Baker, one of the true thought leaders of the profession related to some strategies on how to approach uh, business relief in, in the year ahead. And then we will have our open forum. We've got some questions from all of you, uh, so we'll be addressing those. So here's the, the lineup of speakers, and I'll be uh, introducing them as they join me uh, throughout the program. So kicking this off, I'd like to uh, bring up uh, Mark Peterson, uh, the leader of the AICPA advocacy team. And you can see he's, he's in the Washington, D.C. office. So, so welcome, welcome, Mark. Thanks, and, Eric. And what we're doing is we've been we've been busy, uh, you know, talking to these different stakeholders, and we're going to get right into some of the the latest information. And Mark, as we're moving out of this massive business relief phase, uh, we still have plenty of big big uh, bills uh, in store uh, with what with what the Biden administration is proposing. No, absolutely, and and it, there is a lot breaking right now. Congress happens to be in a post. Memorial Day research, uh, recess, but that doesn't mean that there aren't negotiations going on. And, and you know, a couple things that I want to mention, um, you know, for, for some of you, I've, I've mentioned this before, but the, the part of the process of getting to a deal is is this window of opportunity and it's the, it's the politics around it. And I'm not going to talk about Republicans and Democrats. I'm going to talk about the majority and the minority because this would all be true regardless of who was in the administration. They're trying to figure out how they get deals done. And the important numbers for that are 218 votes in the House. Uh, and right now, Speaker Pelosi only has about a six seat majority uh, with some open seats. And then it's getting 50 senators to agree with a, with a tiebreaker. And that is incredibly important um, because they have to be perfect. Uh, and that's not often a word that you hear uh, in Washington and, and around our po political system these days. And another thing, you know, we keep an eye on other bills. We keep an eye on how negotiations are going um, on, on other issues. There's a, a um, New Frontiers bill, which is actually focused, Eric, on competitive issues with China mm -hmm. that was supposed to be headed towards a bipartisan resolution right before they left for Memorial Day recess. And actually those discussions broke down. So that is not a good indication of, you know, how things are going, working across the aisle. But they're going to come back and they're going to try and reload on that bill and they'll, try, they'll start to look at the negotiations that are going on uh, on other issues. And, and let's, let's take that into really the two big things, the two major initiatives that the uh, Biden administration is working with, the Democrat majority in the House and the Senate. And it's really this idea of an infrastructure bill, big infrastructure bill, jobs. Uh, and then uh, a family focused bill that's really about education and child tax credits and those types of things. So right now I'm going to discuss them separately. There is a real sincere uh, effort going on, a negotiation between uh, the Senate, some handful of Senate Republicans, Shirley Moore Capito from West Virginia and the Biden administration, the president meetings have been going on this week in order to figure out how to reconcile an infrastructure bill. Infrastructure has always been the one issue that everyone felt they could resolve in a bipartisan way. Now, there's two things that get, are the hang up. It's the size of the bill, and there's still a gap between what the Republicans are proposing, this group of senators, and where uh, the Biden administration has, has set the mark. And it's about a trillion dollars off uh, right now. And then there's how you pay for it, right? And uh, a, a, a lot of concern on the Republican side and some Democrats about this idea of, you know, taking the corporate rate up to, to 28 percent. And we just did hear that maybe there's an alternative of looking at a, you know, a minimum 15 percent uh, for corporates, which would raise some money to help pay for an infrastructure bill, along with a concept 
of retasking some of the um, support monies that they've had for economic recovery post COVID. This is all so early. It is, it is, it's a good indication of direction, but just because these things are being discussed in negotiation doesn't even mean that all of the 50 senators required on the Democratic side are going to support it or whether they're going to pull along another 10 Republicans. So very early, I think that it's good to see sincere negotiations going on. But I also think where we're probably headed, uh, and this could change, is towards combining those two, that infrastructure bill, Mm -hmm. uh, if in fact the negotiations break down, and then this larger tax package that they're talking about, um, you know, paying for it by, um, uh, you know, increasing the the uh, bracket on on high net wealth individuals and and several other pay fors. Again, it's not just the programs that you are are for in these packages. It's how do you pay for them? And so we're going to see that all come together. The big thing is, I, I mentioned it's this window of opportunity, and you got to have the votes. And then it's the process in order to get that. And we, we, you hear a lot about reconciliation, which is the ability to use a simple majority, just 50 votes in the Senate and the VP breaking it. And we think we're, we think that's where this is headed. Um, I, I am not dismissing negotiations that are going on, Eric, but probably headed towards the fall uh, and combining these into a larger bill. If that uh, processes use reconciliation, it does have limits. They have to pass a budget in the House and Senate. There are parameters about um, the types of provisions that can be included. And so there's a long way to go on that. One of the things that we saw last week, which is news, is that the, the White House put out their budget. They also put out what's called the Green Book, which are the details that go along with the budget. Now, the, the administration's budget is non-binding. Um, administrations put them out and many times Congress just ignores them. Some administrations don't put them out. However, they do give you a sense of direction of where they're going to start to go. And so that's our first level of detail. Again, you know, I'm going through you know, massive um, packages of, of summary, but we still have to see, and the next step will be a House and Senate working through their budget resolutions if in fact they, they go to reconciliation because they'll need those. That's kind of the way the process is working moving forward at the moment. And Mark, just when you think about this, I mean, it, it, it's June already. I hope everybody had a good good Memorial Day weekend. We, we, we encourage everybody to take Memorial Day weekend off. But when you think about it, it's June. We, start, we, we started this year so fast. We had the $900 billion uh, bill from the previous administration, you know, the business relief bill that made PPP2. Then you had the $2 trillion bill in March. You had the extension of the PPP program. And now we're talking about another couple trillion potentially. And then as, we, we, as we've been talking about in the last couple of town halls, this incredible economic growth that's occurring this year. So right. you've got these, I mean, you've got all these other factors occurring and you've got these, you know, now we have all the investigations going on with business relief. So those, that's the environment uh, that, these congressmen, congressmen, women, senators are are working in, and that's gonna must have an impact on you know what eventually gets passed. But I mean, we were talking July fourth; it's almost July fourth here, and now you're saying maybe maybe Labor Day. But just the environment that we're in of this massive business relief and, and the economic growth. No, there, there's no doubt. It's it. it would, listen, this, these would be challenging negotiations under different circumstances, but right now, you know, things like the corporate rate. Um, You know, at a point in time when we're focused on economic recovery, um, you know, that's not necessarily going to, you know, they're going to have some challenges just on the Democrat side getting the votes for that. And that's why where I think kind of this trial balloon of a minimum, um, you know, was was floated. But again, trial balloon is the word. Uh, We're going to have to wait and see how this plays out. So I think, you know, they're going to come back from this recess. They're going to spend some time focusing on negotiating and selling because they got to sell the program then you know we'll come back after the fourth of july and we'll start to talk about the budgets that we need house and senate has to pass one and then we're probably into september eric when they they would actually be getting to the the beginning of a bill which would play out in the fall and potentially into next year but i will say historically we know that the big items happen 
in you know the first two years of an administration and probably the first year and a half an administration so that window of opportunity is is shrinking and if they're going to get it done they've got to focus on it well maybe you covered some of these mark but just maybe, maybe a couple of additional details sure. uh, and also you know everyone's you know kind of hot topic the uh, irs penalty relief yeah, no, lots of discussion about IRS service. So, you know, I think the, the biggest question we're getting is how are capital gains going to be impacted if there's a, a major tax package? And then the question is, will they be retroactive? So the way I'm answering it now, which again, we do, don't have details and we've got to see how this plays out is if there's a bill, they will impact capital gains. I, we believe that if there's a bill, they will definitely um, increase capital gains. So if... If that happens, how will they handle retroactivity? And the way I respond to that is, historically, we have seen retroactive provisions, um, it, it, whether it's to impact behavior, they want to impact the behavior of a taxpayer, uh, or it's because of the score. They're trying to figure out in a 10-year window how they manage the cost of a bill. And I, it's too early to tell you on retroactivity, other than historically, in these major provisions, we have seen uh, retroactively. Sometimes it's the date of introduction. So when, when a big bill is introduced, sometimes it's the date of enactment. And other times they just pick a date because they think it makes the most sense from a policy perspective. Corporate rate, I discussed, you know, all this discussion about going up to 28%. Now this new trial balloon of, of a minimum uh, have yet to be seen. Actually, it sounded a lot to me like what they were talking about on the international side, which was an international minimum of 15%. And then, you know, again, there's going to be a focus on in increasing the rate on high net wealth over 400,000 uh, in income. And so, you know, the, that's just some of the headlines. There's going to be a lot that goes into that. And then again, one of the things we watch is how do you pay for these things? And so there may be things, Eric, that focus on partnerships uh, that could impact CPA firms. And so we're definitely going to keep an eye on that. And then, um, you know, just to kind of round things out, because we do hear a lot about uh, IRS service. You know, we've had a, couple, a rough couple of filing seasons. We know that. Uh, we know that there's a backlog of correspondence. Um, we're working closely with the IRS. Um, you know, they're good people that try hard, but we also have to stick up for the profession when things aren't working. And we know there's, you know, millions of, of backlog correspondence. We know that phone calls are not getting answered. Uh, and so we, we have made some recommendations to try and help that. If you can't address the service issue in the backlog, you know, let's focus on some penalty relief. Let's focus on, you know, expanding um, reasonable costs for more than first time abatement. And then, you know, how about even just delaying uh, the notifications that are going out until you know that you've addressed the corresponding issues. There are several others to, that we've made recommendations to, but the idea is, to work with both the IRS Treasury and we are, are having conversations on Capitol Hill to address what is just a huge pain point for not only practitioners, but for their clients. And I'm you know, telling a group that knows that full well. Well, Mark, a good, great summary. We'll bring you back for open forum. And there's a lot. I mean, the IRS is busy and we're going to get into the SBA and the SBA has got a, got a lot of work. And then, then you've got, you got ERC. So there's so much relief out there. There's so much, uh, you know, different uh, compliance elements that need to get through these these governmental agencies. So uh, it's uh, it, things are be maybe slowing down, but there's still there's still a lot a lot to be done. Absolutely. So th thanks, Mark, and uh, let's uh, bring Lisa Simpson up. So Lisa, as I said, we're in a one hour uh, uh, you know tape delay here. So welcome. Thanks. Glad to be here, even if it's a little late. Even it's a little, a little bit late. I forgot to mention you. Since this is an archive, you you can earn CP. Maybe we'll do an we'll do a special town hall edition uh, later on to kind of make up for this uh, hour of CPE lost. But Lisa, let's get right into it. We've got, you know, we've got these four big business relief programs. Um, you know, the fame, the biggest one, PPP. Uh, we're going to talk about that how it's how it's winding down, and then we'll kind of get into uh, a little bit about uh, the, these these next three. So anything broadly you want to say before we just kind of jump into it? I think um, pivoting to PPP forgiveness is is a great place to, to get going. Well, before we get to PPP forgiveness, we do have to mark that uh, the SBA, this is a, a, a note from Isabel Guzman, uh, the uh, the administrator of the SBA, officially announcing uh, the closure of the PPP program. 
so here's here's the final. Now, these aren't the final numbers because actually there still are applications that could get approved, um, but there's no more submitting of applications into the SBA by the lenders. And for the final few weeks, as we all know, it was just that CFI category. But here's here's how large it was. You know, this is this is 2020 and 2021. 11.8 million loans were approved for 800 a billion dollars. This shows the breakdown. You know, we'll we'll be looking at this uh, more in future town halls. This was historic, and you all played a very significant role. What I'll so just what I'll say, just from a tactical standpoint, on what's still happening, lenders are still funding um, loans that have ETRAN numbers. So. Some of your clients may have not signed a document or got a document into the bank. They've got an ETRAN number. Tell them to do that. They've got a little bit of time left. And there's a very, very small chance that's that's something that's in the SBA right now with a hold code is going to get approved. But that there's, there's still a, a slimmer of hope there. Um, but we're basically in the, the very final stages. So, Lisa, anything, anything else that you'd like to add there? It is kind of monumental, like you said, when you look at those total numbers and, and they're going to get a little bigger as, as the next month plays out. But um, congratulations to all of you CPAs and whether you're in your business or helping your clients for getting this monumental achievement over the finish line. Well said. So here. So now. But the thing is, we're going to be talking about this for the, for the remainder of the year. So it's even though the application phase for getting a loan has ended, we're in some ways just really beginning in a material way with the forgiveness process. And we're going to be talking about that here with Lisa, and then we're going to talk about this uh, with Ron Baker on strategies. But you can see here, now we've added 2020 and 2021. What's been forgiven is 3.3 million. Uh, so a large, large, uh, you know, batch of loans, you know, 71% uh, have not have not applied for forgiveness yet. So a lot of lot of work that needs to be done. These small businesses got to get these forgiveness applications in, and 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 the and the clock is ticking, uh, Lisa, for that. Yeah, I think one of the important numbers on this slide, though, is that of the two hundred and eighty billion that's been processed, mm -hmm. only one billion hasn't been forgiven. So this does go back to the conversations that we've had. With Treasury and the SBA for the past year and a half, that the intent is for these to be forgivable loans. So um, we're, we're seeing that play out in this first um, tranche of, of numbers, and hopefully we'll continue to see that trend. But Lisa, with that said, it's, it's somewhat like a tax return. To get that 99% for, uh, of forgiveness, you have to do a forgiveness application. <laughs> so you, you do. <laughs> you have to apply. You have to do it. You know, there's going to be. We all know it. There's going to be. We are hearing it from the lenders. The lenders. There's procrastination, or there was just delays. Sometimes it wasn't procrastination. There were strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, but Lisa, there's a lot that that the firms can be doing here related to the forgiveness process. Yeah, and we've been encouraging firms to make sure that they're talking with their clients about the strategies because you had PPP, ERC interplay then you had SVOG and RRF thrown into the mix and they were all working together to make the decision on when to file for PPP forgiveness pretty complicated. So now that that has, um, the application phase has, play, has played out on all of those programs other than ERC, you can start really digging into forgiveness. And we've been telling lenders that um, you know, since the beginning of the year, that it was just gonna take some time to do the analysis. But if you are ready to start that analysis and you're, you're trying to figure out what your strategy is for helping your clients, we, we talked a couple of weeks ago about, you know, do you want to be fully hands-on and working very closely with your clients through that forgiveness process, mapping out how much they've spent on payroll and non-payroll costs, and, or, or are they going to do the application themselves, ask you to take a look at it, or are they going to try to submit it themselves? So as you're talking about the services that you want to provide to your clients, we have some resources to help you around structuring those services. So we have a forgiveness services matrix that gives you links to engagement letters, links to sample procedures that, that we're in the process of updating. 
And it's really about a conversation with your clients. How can you help them to the fullest extent and, and what exactly is it that they're looking for? We've said it on, in the past, we'll continue to say it every town hall, be really careful about your forgiveness applications because the process of amending a forgiveness application is gonna be really tough. It's not like amending a tax return. It's not like going back for a, an amended payroll tax filing. It's gonna be a real challenge to amend a PPP forgiveness application and get it through the process. So take your time, make sure that as you're helping your clients at the level that, that you've agreed to, that the documentation is complete and that you're, you're helping them gather and accumulate a complete application file. Here's one of the questions that we've been getting quite frequently these days. Um, if you have a client or if you were a business who got a loan early in April, 2020, the, so the first round of PPP, then you might be wondering, uh-oh, when are my payments due? And the question that we're getting is framed as, um, if the borrower's already applied for forgiveness, do they have to begin making payments while they're waiting on the forgiveness determination? So lots of words on this slide. I've given you a link to the guidance from uh, January 19, 2020, I, or 2021 IFR on forgiveness. I've pulled out in purple what I think is most relevant for this particular question. So it says, if the borrower does not apply for forgiveness within 10 months after the last day of the longest available cover period, which is 24 weeks, or if the SBA has decided that the loan is not eligible for forgiveness, either totally or just a part of it, the payments are no longer deferred and the borrower must begin making payments. Then it's up to the lender to say, okay, here are the amount of your payments and here's when they are due. So that's what the IFR says, but what does that really mean? And so on the next slide, well, so, I mean, this, this is, this is a, this is a, it's a, it's a least a special slide, <laughs> but this is a good takeaway slide. And, and it, it does refer to that IFR that, that we think is, is important related to this process. Absolutely. But, but in talking to lenders, there's, there's still a little bit of confusion about it because they're not sure if the um, loan, if the payment deferral is stopped because the borrower has submitted an application to the lender, or is it a full and complete application and the, and the lenders made their decision, or is it deferred until um, the SBA comes back with their decision? So we don't think that waiting for the SBA decision is, um, is, is relevant in our understanding of that IFR that I just read you. When the borrower submits the application, it seems like the payment um, deferral would continue. That's lenders have some questions about it. They're going to check with the SBA on it, and we'll keep you posted. But their concern, and I, I think that um, you know, if, if we think to um, some some businesses we've dealt with, maybe there will uh, someone will submit an incomplete application and then procrastinate. So they're just trying to get a process that will run smoothly, and when we're trying to get to the latest information, so we'll keep you posted on that. Yeah, at least I think it's an important. This is where we're going to work again to, to drive to drive the common approach, working with the lenders, talking to the SBA. If you do the math, uh, the 24 weeks plus 10 months, uh, that this is going to the witching hour is going to be late late July, related to when this really be, becomes a a, de a decision point. So this is something that is going to become much more active. Uh, and everyone's going to get very, very concerned with those eight million loans. If will they, uh, if they, you know, they get the, will they be able to defer those principal and interest payments? So more to come on this, um, and and something that we're we're going to take an active uh, leader leadership role in, and and a date a date a date of if it's late end, end of July or if there's some grandfather period that that the SBA puts out, it's still important probably to have a date to drive these businesses to get these applications in with support of the firms and obviously the filing of the lenders. So let's move on to uh, to RRF, uh, Lisa. Okay, so RRF, the application portal has closed and we believe that they've gotten about 360,000 applications asking for over $75 billion. 
only 28.6 was allocated. Um, not a lot of movement going on actively around replenishing or adding additional money to that program. But um, you know, we know that the, the restaurant um, industry, the hospitality industry was hit hard. So we'll, again, we'll keep you posted. But at this point, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of activity moving right now. There is, however, a legal challenge making its way through the court around the prioritization period that was built into the Restaurant Revitalization Fund program um, by the law. So some restaurants have challenged whether or not that prioritization period is appropriate. And um, again, not a whole lot of movement on it right now, but we do know that um, some of the entities who applied for these restaurant grants have gotten a notice of award. Those came out either late last week or over the weekend. And this week, some businesses are actually getting funded. Um, the numbers around what's actually been approved, what's actually being sent out the door are hard to find. We, we've been talking with folks at um, hospitality associations and they don't have them either. So a, a little darkness around the numbers there, but um, we'll keep an eye, eye out for them. A lot of anxiety. I mean, you talk to the firms out there, there's anxiety uh, where your clients stand. And there's obviously some frustration with some of the groups that are doing these legal challenges uh, that, that, were, that are not eligible uh, due to how, how the criteria was set. So I don't know if you know, you saw this, at least right before we came on, there was some, there was some data that, that came out on the number. Did you see the number? I of didn't. Shuttered venue operator grant. I just saw it. Oh, yeah. 31. They've funded uh, 30, 30, 31. They've gotten 13,000 applications and 31 have been approved and funded uh, for, you know, under like under 20, less than like under $30 million. So uh, it's, uh, it started April 8th and two months in, uh, $30 million has been distributed. So it's a little bit slower than maybe the distribution that occurred um, in 2020 around PPP. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard that number. So thanks for sharing that one. This one is obviously having a, a, a hard time getting off the ground, but we did get notices um, last week that the priority award notices have been going out. And um, if you do have any clients or if you did apply for one of these, it's important that you physically log into the system because they want you to confirm some information before they will distribute the funds. I've also seen, seen media reports of um, some applicants being rejected because they are in the, um, hey, sorry, but you're dead file. So um, we got some cleaning up that needs to happen within SVOG, similar to some of those hold codes that came up in PPP earlier this year. All right, we couldn't let a day go by without talking about employee retention credit. We get this question a lot and we um, actually put it into the town hall newsletter, but I just wanted to call to your attention that whether or not 50% um, or more shareholder wages and um, wages for an eligible spouse are eligible for employee retention credit. If you asked um, 10 CPAs, you'd probably get five that say yes and five that say no. There is no definitive IRS guidance on this issue. So just wanted to, to point that out. Um, and, and you may just be having to have those conversations with your clients about that divergence of opinion. And ERC is going to become, it's something we're going to continue to talk about. And it's a capability that we're thinking about how we can provide more, more services and support for you around. So more, more to come on that. Yeah, so ERC Lisa, is, is really complicated and, and um, it, it's probably going to be a good opportunity for you to work with a referral network to find another CPA firm that has, you know, the staff and resources or a, pro a technical provider that can dig into it. Well, thanks, Lisa. We'll, we'll bring you back, uh, we'll, all, all of us, uh, for open forum. But now let's um, bring up uh, Ron Baker, a good friend. and. And one thing in, in this past year, uh, what I've thought a lot about is the importance of, of strategy and really thinking differently. And when I think about strategy and thinking differently, uh, Ron, you are somebody uh, that c comes to mind. Uh, so, so welcome to today's town hall. Oh, thank you, Eric. I'm thrilled to be here. 
And just a little bit of background, most of you know Ron. Ron started his career at KPMG. He's the founder of the Veris Age Institute, uh, which is all about helping knowledge workers and you know doing you know very strategic work around value pricing. He also leads uh, the Soul of Enterprise, uh, uh, a great podcast that he does with Ed Kless, which I recommend uh, you checking out. But what we're gonna we're gonna have a we're gonna have a discussion here. It's really gonna be we're gonna we're gonna dive into some of Ron's thinking about about pricing strategies. Uh, but we're gonna start out at a, at a high level, just on you know what you know a little retrospective on what's what's happened for the past year. So we've got some slides here for reference, but we can. We can drop the slides, and I just want to have a, have a conversation uh, with with Ron. So, Ron, wow, uh, twenty twenty <laughs> was a is a defining year, and um, I I just know you 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 you've thought a lot about it. You and I have had discussions. So, give us some of your perspective on it. Well, one thing that hits me, Eric, is this idea of remote work. I mean, a lot of firms, you know, used to say, "Oh, it can't be done," and then when COVID hit, it got figured out, and we're able to do it. And I hope I hope we don't lose that mindset because it it's we shouldn't even say remote work. The mindset needs to be uh, of the results only work environment. Mm -hmm. Work is something we do. It's not a place we go. And since we're in the cloud and we have all this digital access, it's not like we work in factories where we have to be there. We're not tied to a factory. We can work anywhere. And I'm, I'm not saying that we should never go back in the office. I mean, you still need that camaraderie and that face-to-face -face interaction, but we just need to let people take control of their own schedules and the results only work environment, I think needs to be the mindset going forward. And I hope, I hope more firms have converted to it as a result of the past year. Well, Ron, so you, I mean, that's, I think that's great. That's excellent perspective. So everyone talks about the acceleration, the accel the digital acceleration, but what you're talking about here is this acceleration of this results oriented culture and outputs. And that's in some ways, that's what, that what firms and knowledge workers are all about. So that, that's a, that's a dramatic shift that people need to need to think more about. It is because it changes what we measure. Right now we measure inputs and activities and hours, but we don't really have good mechanisms for measuring outputs because that requires judgment. It requires the judgment of a knowledge, another knowledge worker to, to judge the quality of the work of a, of a fellow knowledge worker. And I think we spend too much time measuring inputs and not enough time focusing on the outcomes that we generate. Well, let's let's this year at conferences, we're going to there's going to be if there's one talk about how to return to work, there's going to be 10, Ron. And and is you and I discussed before today, there's not a one size fits all. So you you're hearing strategies. Uh, if it's Goldman Sachs saying they're bringing 100 percent of their workforce back, uh, you've got another technology firm saying we're all going remote. So that this is in some ways that's going to add to confusion who's right and and I, you know my thinking is that they're they're probably both right because you can't look at this um in a in a in a one size fits all approach but maybe a couple of comments from you on that no i think you're i totally agree eric i think you're right i don't think there is a one size fits all i'm not advocating for complete remote work or offsite work i totally get why apple and google want their people together because of that innovation, that spark, those serendipitous, you know, conversations in the hallway and whatnot. Uh, all I'm really arguing for is more, no matter whether you're remote or in the office, we should be judged on the results that we create, not the time that we put in, because I think that's a flawed measurement. You can't measure the value of a knowledge worker's contributions by the amount of time that they spend on something. It's the equivalent of plunging a ruler into the oven to determine its temp its temperature. It's the wrong measuring stick. Well, that that makes sense. So let's, you know, just talk a little bit more about 2020. When one thing we said at the start was in the first hundred days, 10 years of, of relationships uh, have been built were were or better were better defined. You've talked a lot about uh, you know firms being in the relationship business and maybe talk about that and, and, and also talk about what you think this means to the overall pricing model. 
Yeah, I think this is the biggest lesson I take away from the last year on top of Roe even is that we need to put the relationship at the center of firms' business models. And look, we've always talked about the relationship and we've always known how important it is. But I think in some respects, we've paid lip service to it. Now we need to put our money where our mouth is. The subscription business model puts the relationship at the center of the business and it monetizes that relationship. So now we're forced to pay attention to it. We're forced to bring to bear all the resources needed, whether it's all this PPP that you guys have done such an excellent job keeping track of, or they're in tax issues or, or they need a state planning, uh, you know, revisions or whatever it might be. We're like their general physician. We just do it. They're covered. And that puts that relationship at the center. We need to stop selling services and stop thinking about selling services because that's a transactional mindset. And your revenue starts at zero every day. <laughs> every day you have to get back on the treadmill and sell, 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 and look, look, look. The subscription business model starts you at the 50 yard line every day. You've got that annual recurring revenue and it monetizes the relationship. And what we've also seen over the last year and a half is that subscription business models have been the most resilient through this COVID crisis. They're the only ones that are growing. They're the only ones that are thriving and flourishing. I mean, not the only ones, but a, a large majority of the businesses out there that are doing really well are based on subscriptions. And I think that that's got lessons for us as CPA firms. Well, let's let's just go into that a little deeper right now, Ron. We, 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 I want to get into what the forgiveness in, in ERTC practice strategies, but I think this is important. I mean, this is this is somewhat profound. You see, you know, you 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 we the uh, the time and billing method to value billing now the subscription model, and without a doubt, you, you you see huge valuations as we know with SaaS companies with subscription billing, but also the biggest one of the biggest growth areas is client accounting services, and in some ways, that is a that is a subscription model. When you say uh, I'm going to be your outsource CFO and I'm going to do these services and this is this is your monthly uh, bill uh, your monthly cost for that but you're taking it more broadly even even uh, with what's going on here with forgiveness advisory you're saying to use a little bit of the medicine model and say you and this is the progressive medicine model to move to a subscription model for your small business clients right especially when we talk about CAS. I, I know a lot of firms are doing it and it's a growth opportunity, but they say they're doing subscription when they take a fixed price and divide it by 12. So you get these 12 right. monthly payments. That's not subscription. That's a pricing methodology or payment term methodology, but it's not a subscription business model. The subscription business model that I look to that I think is a good fit for our profession is the concierge doctors. Right. And if, if I sign up with a concierge doctor, five grand a month for me, my family, possibly a couple kids, whatever, I'm covered. That doctor will do anything he's capable of doing under his roof, uh, whatever I need, whenever I need it, house calls, office visits, you know, whatever. And that's the model I'm looking at. It's not dependent on services. It's dependent upon the relationship. Now, you can still set up different options. You could still have different pricing tiers, mm -hmm. you know, but the mindset shifts from scope out of scope to covered versus non-covered. And for example, if all of this PPP work was put into another pricing tier, right. then the people that were the businesses that were affected by this could easily upgrade to that pricing tier, get that all the PPP work done. Yeah. And then once it was all over, they could slide back down. You've got to make it really easy for the customer to have complete control over their purchase. And we're used to the subscription model. When I ask a uh, CPAs, how many things do you subscribe to? It's usually at least a dozen. If you ask firms how many things they subscribe to, it could be 60 to 100 yeah. things. We're all used to paying for software and, mm -hmm. and you know designers and all sorts of things that we can subscribe to. So it's a model that makes complete sense. And it's also, it's hyper growth. I mean, if you want to grow, you can grow it. If you don't want to grow, you don't have to. It's a very flexible, but resilient business model. And, and I think we're at a, we're at an inflection point here as we as we move now into the reopening, we move into this final phase of forgiveness. Last April and May, we were in triage, and I remember having a discussion with you, and and I think it was on a town hall, and you said, you know, you don't, you just don't even talk about, you know, what what you're, if you're going to bill or not bill, you just you just help 
the small business, help your client. This is a moment. But now we're in a, we're in a different state. The firms have worked so hard, or the, if you're a CFO or controller and in, in business and industry, it's been a very, very long year. And it's okay to take a step back and to say, okay, what, where am I going? And what and be intentional about what what you want to do. So when you you this when you think is this is this so this is something with maybe some of their clients and I've heard some firms that did do this bronze silver gold kind of you know subscription model with the application process. This is an opportunity to think about this for the business relief process, and and there's going to be this interplay between ERTC and and PPP. So. How do you do that? How do you, how do you how do you start, Ron? Um, I mean, you, you're thing, Ron. I didn't mention this. You're at Armino as a chief value officer, but we've got a lot of mid-sized and small firms. How do you start uh, moving down a, a different you know practice model that 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 you're describing here? It's going to require some experimentation and segmentation of your customer. So I would first look at those customers affected by the relief that you need to do for them and possibly either create packages for them that include that and price it accordingly. Uh, the great thing about moving to subscription is you're since you're also giving the customer peace of mind and you're selling outcomes now, you're not selling services, we're not tied to services, we're tied to outcomes and that peace of mind and the convenience, it's also a very frictionless business model. There's not a lot of paperwork, your payments come in, it, it, there's not a lot of billing, there's not all this, you know, timesheet and whip and all this stuff that we spend a lot of time that creates zero value, or even I would argue detracts from value. Um, we're selling outcomes. And I think this is a really good time to make that shift. Now, I'm not saying that shift is easy. But if you're committed to it, you can certainly do it, you can offer it maybe to a certain uh, tier of customer, or maybe just start with your business customers, but you have to be committed to it. Because I don't think you can operate two business models inside the same firm. And if you're really concerned about a firm's uh, willingness to make the transition, maybe the smart thing to do is set up a separate firm that's completely independent uh, and run the subscription model out of there. Well, that's, that's definitely a provocative uh, uh, idea. Well, let, let's let's just let's t move on and talk a little bit about some of the things, Ron, that that that's happening in the marketplace related to these different you know relief programs and and some of the other. I mean, I want the audience to know here that we are seeing this contingency pricing uh, occur with ERTC, where if you Google that, there's a there's a bunch of consultants, non CPA firms. Because a licensed CPA firm cannot do the contingency fee for for any ERTC filing, offering ten percent. You know they'll do it. Uh, they'll do it. They'll do the full return um, and take ten percent. Sometimes these these tax credits could be worth a million dollars. They're charging a hundred thousand. Seeing the same thing for forgiveness. Um, some some mark. You know putting price points of you know five to ten to twenty thousand dollars to do a forgiveness application. So as a, as a pricing expert. How do how do you how do you see that, and how how should the firm respond to that or advise their clients on that? Yeah, and this is something that we have to put up in a lot of different things, right? Because we're getting competition from outside the profession everywhere, but audit really. Uh, my dad was a barber, Eric, and when mm -hmm. Supercuts came out, uh, he put a sign up in uh, over the front of his shop that said, "We fix six dollar haircuts." There you go. Um, and I thought that that was a really good message he sent to his customers. I mean, get what you pay for. But the, the, the deeper point is, if the relationship with the customer was deeper, then when they get these solicitations from these uh, competitors, your, your customers wouldn't pay any attention to them because you handle that. Right. It's like, I'm not going to listen to, I'm not going to pay attention to solicitations for another doctor if I'm subscribed to mine. That's the beauty of subscribing to a firm rather than just purchasing uh, services and engaging in transaction after transaction. You've actually got a relationship that's deep and meaningful. And I, and I think that's in it, it's important to keep that in perspective. And also, I mean, to understand you, you need to have the basic awareness and in, in, as Lisa just mentioned, to partner. There might be, if you don't want to get into your TC, uh, to partner with a firm, to find the right firm uh, to provide that service. 
So Ron, any other, just as we're kind of in, in this business really practice strategy before I, I want to kind of you know talk maybe more long-term, but when you look at, you know, the, just the practice strategy, defining, you know, the process, setting expectations, the engagement letter, uh, the staffing, and then the pricing, how does, so it all comes in you, you because you, and I said, this is provocative, you know, this, the, the, the new firm idea, but it's, 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 it's the collection of those different business practices. And even what we did here, and, and it's very well received always in our town halls, we talk about the technical aspects of, of the compliance. But what I saw over the past six months, the firms that drove more success also put the efforts into the engagement letter, the, the, the staffing, and probably most importantly, the setting of expectations uh, with, with, their, with, with the clients. Right. And this is a great point, Eric, because I think when when you change the pricing first as a result of a change in the business model, I think the pricing change should happen first because that sets the external relationship and expectations with the customer. I mean, that's really important to let the pricing drive the, the customer's expectations. And then we work backwards inside the firm to figure out capacity and staffing and, and those types of issues and the engagement letters, all the admin stuff. Yeah. That is all going to change. If you move say from hourly billing to value pricing, all that stuff has to be changed. And, and it, it depending on the size of the firm can be a lot of work because it's a completely different model. Well, Let's, uh, Ron, just kind of, we go, go back up a little bit. I mean, a lot of your, your podcasts, I mean, you're talking about the value of, of intellectual capital and, and where the knowledge economy is going. So right now, I, I just, the Wall Street Journal uh, today reported that in, in a couple of years, I, I forgot what the exact year, the GDP of the U.S. is projected to be higher than if we did not have a pandemic. So it's that, that, I mean, this is a projection, but that is, that is just, you know, so, somewhat unbelievable when you consider, you know, no one would have thought that a year ago that we, we, in, we potentially could have a larger economy in a couple of years than we would have without, without this pandemic. And people will say, well, you've got all the government surplus. There's a lot of factors there, but when you see what's, what's happening here in the, in the markets here with the supply chain issues, um, and what's going on with the, the changing business model, you know, what, what, provide some of your thinking and perspective on that. Oh, I'm incredibly optimistic about the future. I think, you know, we, this, this growth in the economy, the, the amount of wealth that we've be, been able to create over the past 15 or so years, we've lifted a billion people out of bone crushing dollar a day poverty. I mean, this is a, a, an unwritten success story. And I think it's only gonna get better going forward but our business models do have to adjust. I'll just give you a quick example, Eric. Um, there's a Scandinavian eyewear company, um, optical optics company. They sell glasses and they do eye exams, things like that. They have about 3,500 employees called SinSam. And in 2015, a new group of management came into the C-suite and they said, we're going to launch a subscription program. Now, the optical industry is a very staid, mature industry. It hasn't seen a lot of innovation for quite a while. And all the experts in the industry said, this will never work. Nobody's going to subscribe to eyeglasses. What are you guys kidding yourself? You know, you get eyeglasses, you, you have to go and get an exam, you get a prescription written, maybe mm -hmm. you get it filled online, whatever. These guys launched this program. As of the end of last year, they've had 280,000 active subscribers because here's the thing, they are not selling an eye exam and then glasses. They're selling perfect eyesight mm -hmm. because that's what the customer's paying for. We need to focus on what the customer's paying us for, which is an outcome. And the definition of a professional is to take responsibility for delivering an outcome, not a series of tasks. And I think the billable hour, and even to some extent, value pricing focuses too much on the tasks, the 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 uh, outputs, but not enough on the outcomes. And the subscription model puts the outcomes at the center. And as that happens, that brings real dynamic and robust growth and profitability to a firm. Well, I, I think it's so profound. I mean, in this, I mean, we're stretching. Uh, I think our town halls thinking today, and when you think about 
the complexity that we're living in and the, the needs for this knowledge worker. It was a hard year. It was a hard year for the knowledge worker. And, and that even justifies more, in particular, the, these, these CPA firms uh, to move to a model like what you are discussing. So I think I think this is I, I look at the opportunity. I, I talked to a lot of firm leaders. There's a huge, huge demand for accounting services. And it's it's just like that eye manufacturer in Scandinavia. You got to think differently. I think think differently. So this is this is what this was about thinking differently. Uh, so thanks, Ron. I, I wish this was a, a live one. We're going to get feedback on the next one. Sometimes we get hundreds and hundreds of questions. I know today we would have been getting questions, uh, people agreeing with you. And guess what? Some people disagree <laughs> sure. uh, uh, with you. So any any concluding remarks before we kind of bring our bring our group back? Yeah, just to your point, Eric, and it's a great one. I think in times of, of economic crisis, I mean, look at the depression of the 1930s. Look at the stagflation of the 1970s. We saw incredible innovation, mm -hmm. right? Microsoft, Apple came, grew, grew out of those uh, crises. And I think we're at that same point of inflection in the profession where we can come up with new business models. Business models change. And we have to keep up with the times. We can't just, we just can't ignore it. And I don't think you can ignore subscription. I think in five years, you, you may not, you may not subscribe to everything, but you will have the option to subscribe to everything. And even if your firm ignores that, you're still going to have to deal with it because your competition will be offering it. Well, that's, that's a great, great ending kind of uh, thought there. So thanks Ron. And just stay with us and let's, uh, bring uh, Lisa and Mark back up. Thank and you, uh, Lisa, I know you, uh, PCPS group uh, and the AICPA, the firm group, uh, you've done a lot of work with uh, with Ron Baker over the years. Is there anything you wanna kind of add to the discussion or, uh, or question for Ron? I, I thought, Ron, your insights around how to get started were really helpful. And now's the time. We've gotten through busy season. Firms are gonna be taking some time this summer, hopefully to think about their firm strategies. So you've given them a lot to think about. We're actually working within the PCPS team. We're working on some resources to help firms kind of blow up their business model and just challenge, are these the, the services I would be offering if I started my firm today? Right. Are these the clients I would be marketing to if I started my firm today? Is this how I would price my work if I started it today? So great conversation and, and great setup to get some some really good creative juices flowing over the next couple of months. That's awesome. And I just point out that at Engage, my session is on what I call value pricing 2.0 or the subscription business model. So we'll yeah. be talking about it there too. Definitely looking forward to that one. That's good. You get a, you, do you need a, is it, well, how long is that presentation? Is it an hour or is it one of those hour and 50 minute ones? I think it's an hour. An hour. Okay. Well, it, at least the one thing just, just on that, that comment, like firm I'm here, you know, here we are. So we're reopening. We've got, we've got a few of us back in the office. We're hybrid today. It's a hybrid town hall. And, and what are you hearing about retreats? I mean, are you, I mean, so just to come back and, and to try to find the time. I mean, they've been doing the, they've been doing the, the tasks that Ron been speaking about. Well, what are you hearing about, about retreats? That's a great question. Firms are, they, they've been apart for so long. They haven't gotten their, their partner groups together or their entire firm group together. Some are actively planning um, and offsite, even though they've been offsite for a year, they're planning on getting back together just because there is that beauty in collaborating in a room together. So you can't do everything remotely. Um, so, so they're looking forward to trying to figure out a way to get back together and, and do some of that brainstorming. Well, one thing that it's it, interesting, I know a couple of virtual firms and these virtual firms are getting back together first, actually more, but there's a lot of, there's yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of firms that are back in the office now too. So, but yeah. I'm just, so I, I shouldn't generalize, but the, I know some virtual firms that they're saying, yeah, now it's time for us to get together. So Mark, uh, you know, just kind of a question, you know, more of a CPA specific question, but they, you know, there is some, some legislation around uh, tax preparers out there. Any, any, any comments on that? And, and this is, mm -hmm. I can say this, you know, we've, you, 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 the, the firms have done a great job from an ethical standpoint, uh, from a quality of work standpoint over the past year. And clearly there are, there are some, some issues with some of those uh, non-CPAs non or P10s out there. 
in kind of you know their service levels. But you know, why, why don't you just talk a little broadly about what, what's happening there with uh, the tax payer tax preparer uh, legislation? Yeah, well, it's been a discussion that's been going on for quite a while since the you know the P, the P ten um, was rolled out, and we were proponents of the P ten, and then it's kind of evolved. Um, you know, through uh, several commissioners at the IRS into what are some of the minimum requirements that should go into the paid tax preparers, and that is outside of CPAs, enrolled agents, and attorneys. And, you know, as they have focused on finding money, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the gap uh, that, that they're, they're trying to recover, you know, in order to, to spend on, on some of these programs, um, you know, that's, that's not new. Uh, so, so part of it is, is trying to figure out how they're going to recover some of the, um, you know, under withholding that they're, they're, they're seeing, but then it's also focusing on, on P10 holders. And, and our position always has been um, that some level of regulation needs to be there, but we really do think it needs to be done in the right way. And those are the discussions we're having where, you know, you, you, yes, the IRS should have the ability to, to withdraw a P10 number from a, a tax preparer, pay tax preparers, which they don't have right now. But there should also be something that addresses um, confusion in the market, because it's going to be really easy to confuse, uh, a, a, you know, an entry-level preparer doing 1040s and, you know, uh, enrolled agent or a CPA. And, and then also, you know, dealing with non-signers. So we have a lot of people on, in a CPA firm that touch a return. Um, but ultimately, the signer, the CPA who signs it, is responsible, and so the, those requirements should not be on a non-signing preparer, but really focused on the CPA who is surrounded with all of the ethics and you know legal requirements that we have in the enforcement through the IRS. So it, it's going to be an you know ongoing negotiation and discussion, and, and I think again, you know, they they the commissioner uh, was up a, a month ago, and you know they were really focused on being able to find a trillion dollars. Uh, you know, in this in this cash gap. And so there is a folk that that's disputed, whether it's that number or not. But I think there is going to be a focus on trying to figure out how to recover that subset of that is what do you do with paid tax preparers? So that's kind of how it tees up. Right. And the enforcement, I mean, you're hearing more and more about that. That's like, the, you know, it, you've, you've heard the discussion, Mark, before over the years, but is, is it gaining more steam right now or what's yeah. going to happen there? No, absolutely. I mean, I think that, that you know, that the IRS has had has been focused on modernizations, moving too slow. Part of modernization is resources. Um, you know, I, I think resources are, a, are an important part of that, but not the only part. There needs to be training and technology and other types of things. But in the discussion that we're hearing right now, it's, it's we're going to give the IRS more money to beef up enforcement because we're going to be able to recover more, which we'll be able to put into these programs. And so it's definitely picking up steam. Okay, thank you. Lisa, I'm going to ask Ron one more question. I don't know if you've got one more question, and then you and I can kind of close out. But Ron, when you think, so we, you, you, Mark and I, we're talking about tax, we're talking about business relief, we talked a little bit about client accounting services, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't hit assurance or audit today. But when you think about, you know, the, the big three services, if it's assurance, tax, and accounting services, then advisory, how do you, how do you see just the, 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 the service lines of, of, of the firm evolving and in, in where, where they're going? Boy, that's a great question uh, because I, you know, there's challenges with the test services and the subscription model. So I'm not sure how that will play out. Um, I, I do think uh, audits will probably uh, be shed by more firms, uh, and and it be the be kind of the you know major firm will take over that sector because they're really hard and they're very specialized, and it's hard just to do a few audits. I always when I come into contact with firms that say, oh yeah, we do we do a handful of audits. I'm like, do you know how risky that is? I mean, that's not a really good strategy. Um, so I, I just hope that firms can figure out their lane and stay in it. <laughs> I'm a big proponent of niching, special, more specialization I think is needed. Okay, I mean that without a doubt. I mean, there's assurance, a lot of value in, in that category, but uh, clearly you gotta, you gotta have the, the, the common C uh, to do it right. So, Lisa, any, anything else that you want to ask uh, to the team here before we kind of go into wrap up? When's Ron coming back? That's what I want to ask. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have him back for the end of the year. Audience. We're going to look at all these questions, Ron. What we do is we get a thousand questions. We get the questions. We're going to ask next week. Maybe we'll do a Ron Baker slide. We'll see. We get questions and uh, we'll bring them back to, to help address some of those. I would love to. Thanks for having me, you guys. Thank you, Ron. Thank, Thank you. Ron. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Mark. Absolutely. Thank you.
Okay, so we do have uh, this. Just we we got the closing slide here, just in your deck uh, related to pricing strategies. And you heard from Ron; he's going to be be at Engage. You can go there in person or virtually. That's going to be at the end of uh, July in in Las Vegas. I think we've got a slide on that coming up. Yeah, uh, we should. Good. If we don't, <laughs> so here you can watch um, the archive town halls. Uh, here's a listing of them. You can you know watch them on AICPA TV. We also have them on the AICPA YouTube channel. Um, so whatever is most convenient. Uh, Lisa? Just a look to remind you of, of how to get information on all of those key business relief options. And um, just, you know, some of them are winding down. Some of them are still going. So you got the information you need here. And um, as a reminder, we've got our PPP resources, but we also have information around SVOG and RRF. Um, I gave you a link to a slide that the tax section has around the employee retention credit. So good information there for you. Um, my repeated plug to ask you to take the PCPS um, firm top issues survey, 10 minutes. It's a quick hit and it really helps us focus on identifying what the top challenges are by firm size, mapping those to resources for you or identifying gaps or potential topics for future town halls. So this is your chance to have your voice heard. Uh, so PPP resource that will continue to update as forgiveness fleshes out a little bit is always available for you. And just talking about, you know, evolution of kind of business models in a very, very hot area in the client accounting. We have a few acronyms here in the client accounting services practice that Ron and I were talking about, FP&A, uh, financial planning and analysis, uh, future of your cash practice. We've got a great group here doing this uh, webinar next, uh, when, next Wednesday, June 9th. This is a free webinar, uh, 1 to 2 p.m., we got some firm leaders uh, and, a, and a leading solution uh, talking about how talking about where this category is going with with Tom Hood and, and Michael Sramy. And then we will have our next town hall on June 17th. We're going to come back to you live. It'll be a live one. So this is this is the, the first tape delayed town hall. So hope you enjoyed it. A uh, great session uh, with Ron Baker, Mark Peterson and, and Lisa Simpson, as usual. And we will have Barry Melanson. Uh, with us on the 17th, along with Tom Hood and the, the CFO of TIAA, uh, a very you know, st strategic organization. Uh, so you are all registered um, uh, automatically uh, for these town halls, as you well know, and we got that notification out to you today uh, related to today's change. So hopefully that worked out well. So stay tuned with us uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, that's all for now. I have a good couple of weeks and uh, we'll see you on June 17th. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.